if we find life out there and it's not us, we will deem it not intelligent. But what may be equally as likely is that we find life that's vastly more intelligent than we are. If that's the case, we are putty in their hands. There's nothing we <laughs> Our greatest thoughts will be things that their toddlers do. And so they would run circles around us and some fun science fiction stories portray <laughs> Earth as that this has already happened and Earth is just their zoo. <laughs> We're all just a zoo for these intelligent creatures. And if they're smart enough, they can construct a zoo so that we would never even know we're in one. Isn't that kind of what we do in our zoos? You know, the penguins are in a place where you paint some icebergs. You know, we, we think that they don't know. So if we find some creatures not as smart as we are, I think they would make interesting subjects to explore what, you know, what they're made of, how they work, what's their biology, what do they eat, do they eat? Maybe they just receive sunlight. There's a famous science fiction story, forgive me, I forgot who wrote it, called They're Made of Meat. And these were aliens who came to visit Earth, and they found humans not only being made of eat meat, but they eat other creatures on the planet. And we take that for granted, that we eat other life. But given the sun as an energy source, in principle, you could use the sun as energy. When we sort of do, that's what it means to get energy from plants. And in fact, we're all solar powered in that sense, but very indirectly so. And imagine another species that where they power their bodies from sunlight and they come and see us gnashing on each other's ribs <laughs> for food. It makes us look pretty primitive. You know, ethics, there are a lot of kinds of ethics that people think of. There's, and I'm glad there's an entire you know, branch of philosophy that addresses this. Uh, it, it can get a little intractable in the frontiers of their journals, but I, I think their heart is in the right place, that there's, there, there, there ought to be ways to think about your behavior and its relationship to others and to nature and your environment. So, uh, plus ethics has, have changed over the years, depending on prevailing social mores. There was a day when it was surely ethical to beat your slaves first to have slaves in the first place and then beat them if they didn't obey your commands. Why? Because they were less than human. And in our constitution, they were three-fifths human, you know, even down to mathematical fractions. So, so ethics can and does evolve as a, as a means of thinking about how to treat others. So I think everyone should have some sense, some ethical sense of the world. Otherwise, what would the world be? There would be no civilization were it not for some ethics that we acquire, that we think about, that we deduce, that are built in. And so the extent to which people do not exhibit ethics of some kind is often the unraveling of that civilization. Ethics evolves as we come to learn about the natural world and our relationship to it. And I'd like to think that it's evolving in, a, in, in the right direction in the sense that we are not apart from, but we're participants in a great unfolding cosmic story. And that, I see that not simply as the consequence of an ethical perspective. I come to it from a cosmic perspective. When I look at the commonality of the chemistry of life and the chemistry of the universe and the origin of our elements traceable to the universe. And there's a connectivity there that gives me a sense of participation and belonging to the universe, not a sense of being apart from it and where it's my duty to lord over it. All of this matters, I think, and uh, chances are if there's a kid with a sort of distorted attitude about how to treat others, you go knock on the door and speak to the parents and there it is writ within the behavior of the parents. So maybe it's the re-education of the adults rather than the concern for the kids that matters here. The fact that someone can find himself in the position of saying, it's just a dog, harps back to me hearing people say, oh, it's just a, you know, put your nationality there or put your religion there or put whatever, it's just that. And people justifying uh, wanton slaughter of each other. So I think it's, it's deeper within the species than just whether one person treats the dog one way or another. And to me, that's disturbing.
one of the more fun segments that I had the privilege of participating in in the PBS show Nova Science Now was on animal intelligence and one particular segment was on canine intelligence and so I got to hang out with Chaser, a border collie who had memorized at least a thousand words for toys uh, trained by uh, his owner. And you can't even believe it until you do the experiment yourself, which I did. And so here's this po you can't ask, give me the, the find all thousand. That would take too long. It would just be a boring experiment for television. So I took the mound of thousand, pulled out 10 of them at random. Got, the dog did not see me do this. We took the dog, basically blindfolded it, put it up on the second st story. I picked out 10, put it behind a couch, and one by one I said, find me Inky, which was the name of a little octopus, found it. Find me Butch, the name of a little uh, bruiser animal, a stuffed animal. And the real clever one was I, we put a stuffed animal there that Chaser had never seen nor even heard the name of. It was a little puppet of Darwin. So I put it back there and I said, find Darwin never heard the name before. And so it took twice as long, but Chaser found Darwin, inferring that among the, the toys she could identify, that was not among them. That must be what I sent her to get. And so what I've noticed over the years, over the decades that I've paid attention to this, is the other animals in the animal kingdom Whenever we presume some level of intelligence for them, further research shows that they're smarter than we ever thought, or cleverer than we ever gave them credit for being. In the next generation, I don't think the concept of bird brain will survive, because birds are showing remarkable intelligence, re re remarkable sort of acuity of thought. And so that's a lost phrase. I, I don't think I've heard it in years. You bird brain. Hey, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> Birds are looking pretty good. So, uh, so I think society can change. And uh, part of why we think animals are, are stupid or, or, or limited is, I think, hubris. We don't want anything to rival what we define as our own intelligence. So we feel better if we say, oh, they'll never figure that out. Or they can't do it. And then they do. So I think a lot's going on in the minds of these creatures. A little, more, a little bit more research will tell us more.